show for the Lord, let's show for Jesus. He is our reward. He is our Okay, anyone got questions? No, we good. Question? Oh, first, yeah, from question. a graphic designer standpoint, I am very impressed by your sign. It's all right. Is that a lie? Questions from anybody? What church do you go to? Well, we go to a small church in South Central Kentucky. That's crazy. We have about 50 people. 50 people? Okay. There's no denomination. There's no denomination. 50 people? We're just. Uh, Bible believing, Bible obeying, born again Christians. I'm one of the pastors there. Yeah. So we're here to preach the gospel to you that you might be saved. The Bible says uh, about Jesus, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Bible says, at just the right time, when we're without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Yet God demonstrates his own love towards us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you are here today and you are a sinner, if you're ungodly, you're qualified to be saved. Christ died for you, that you might be saved. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out. That times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. If you want your sins blotted out, if you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want times of refreshing to come from the presence of the Lord, you must repent, therefore, and be converted. What's your question, man? Uh, suppose I give you all that. I mean, a lot of people here would agree. Uh, we're kind of a little shaken up by your comments from your partner over there, like women shouldn't speak in public, and uh, that God doesn't love us unconditionally. Well... So women, women are allowed to speak in public. It's not a problem. They should be timid or something shit like that. Well, let me let me just read to you from the Bible. First, I don't care what that says. I mean, you can. Well, you may not care, young man, but you're you're asking me what I believe. And what I believe is based upon the Bible. I know. I don't care about your interpretation of it. Because no, I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to interpret. I'm going to read it. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I can pull out verses on my ass that say strike babies on a rock. And First Timothy oh, chapter two. Mean anything? First Timothy chapter two and verse uh, nine. I, I'm really looking it for says, a uh, position. In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, modest. with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, right. but which is proper for women professing godliness sir, with good works. Sir, that was Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. That's in Corinthians. For Ad this is First Timothy. Okay, Timothy. For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. Right. Well, and Adam was not the seed, but the woman being the seed fell into transgression. So the two reasons it gives there for a woman not being able to teach or have authority over a man in biblical matters here, okay, mm -hmm. is because Adam was formed first, and Eve was deceived. Those, it's not a cultural thing. People might tell you, well, that's because the Corinthian church was having some women who were speaking out of turn. It has nothing to do with that. The two reasons are because Adam was formed first and because Eve fell into transgression. She sinned first. So, suppose, suppose I even grant you all of that. How do, you, how do you take those comments and turn it into women should be timid in this context here? Because no. That's exactly what your partner was No, saying. I don't think that's what he said at all. But um, if you have a problem with what he said, you can talk to him. I didn't hear every single word he said, but I've known him for over eight years now. He's one of my closest friends on earth, so you're not going to lie to me about what he said. I mean, I know, I know, what, he I know what he believes. I know what he believes, okay? But when it comes to biblical things, teaching doctrine, women are not allowed to teach men doctrine and to have authority over them in that way. Now, if a woman wants to teach a man how to, how to cook or... Oh my God! Or something like that. That's not a problem. Or if he wants to teach, teach a man how to change the, change the oil in his car. No problem with that. Yeah, you're married, aren't you? It doesn't have to. It has to. Can't. Listen, you know, it, I I can understand if you just want to say I don't believe the Bible, I don't agree with it. But listen, the Bible says what it says. You're not going to be able to twist it to say something different. It says in the Bible. Done for two millennia. It says in the Bible that women are not allowed to teach or have authority over men, and the context is biblical manners. So that's what the Bible says. Now you can disagree with it. You can not like it. You can throw the Bible out the window if you want to. You have to give an account for that. But I'm going to believe and obey the Bible. 
What about the unconditional love part? What about unconditional love? That God doesn't love us unconditionally. What do you mean by that? That's exactly what he's. No, what do you mean by unconditional love? Define, hold on a second, define your terms. That God loves us no matter what we do. Well, the Bible never says that. The Bible says that God demonstrated his love for you, and that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. So he, he loves you unconditionally in this sense, young man. That he wants you to be saved, and he sent his son to die for you on the cross. Okay, I agree with that. But he doesn't love, every, like, he's going to cast sinners into hell. You realize that, right? Sure. And you can't, you will never convince me that when sinners are burning in hell forever, that he loves them. You'll never convince me of that. And the Bible never says that. In fact, the Bible talks about a kind of love that God has for the saints, for Christians, in John 14, 21. Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So there's a special kind of relational love. Like, I have a love for all of you here, but my love for you is different than my love I have for my wife or for my children. I love them in a different sense than I love you because I have a relationship with them that I don't have with you. And so God's relationship, he only has a relationship, a good relationship here, with people who actually love him and obey him. Now he has a relationship with sinners, but it's not a good one. It's not a one you want to continue in if you're a sinner. It's one you want to reject and get right with God. So you can have a good relationship with Him. He wants to be in a relationship with you where you can talk to Him, He can talk to you. You'll actually have a, uh, you know, friendship with Him. But the Bible says that sinners are enemies of God. It says in John, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And the Bible also says that God hates the whole workers of iniquity. And Psalm 5.5 5 and Psalm 11.5. So you have to deal with these things. Obviously, you're not a Christian, so you don't really care about that. But as a, as a, How do you know what I am and am not? Because what you've, you've said so far, young man, the fruit of your lips. Out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart, the Bible says. Jesus said. So I know by what you're saying. You, you, judge, you judge a tree by its fruit. So That hurts. Uh, what hurts? You, you said you didn't care about the Bible a minute ago. No, no, no. I said I didn't care about your interpretation. You, you had cuss words coming out of your mouth a minute ago to a young man. So out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart so 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 yes I know you're not a Christian by what you say young man okay I'm, unless and, and unless you're lying and then of course you're still a liar it still makes you a sinner so you're still in trouble so Christians actually obey God okay they keep his commandments what's your question man I was gonna say if women are supposed to not preach and women are supposed to be subservient to men. no I didn't say they couldn't preach you said, you just, no, 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 that's not what I said. I actually read from the Bible. I said they can't teach. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. Teaching has to do with doctrine and theology. Women should be preaching, if they're a Christian, should be preaching the gospel to the lost. They have just as much responsibility in that area as I do. And when it comes to teaching and having authority over men, that's what it's talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, what I just read to you a second ago. Times have changed too since the Bible. Exactly, which is why we need to well, why a lot of it should so be accustomed to the ways that you guys are talking about. The Bible is a little bit different. The Bible isn't updated every 10 minutes, okay? Why not? But but what it says is still true. What it says is still absolute. Interactions in your everyday interactions with women and men that you can't even like talk about something with the Bible because you think it's so like different than what you're used to because you're born into this world and you grew up in this society and that's how you view women, that's how you interact with them every day. The Bible is just giving you an account of something very long ago that held a very high standard of how that they discipline their doctrines and how they teach and how they deal with their religion. This is a very long time ago and that's why you feel so shocked that he's making statements like this. But it's still true. But it's still true. But, but it's still true. true. Still true. true. The Bible is still true. What's that? Modern, shouldn't we take those truths to those statements and apply the spirit of them to this world to rather than impose exactly what they say in their culture and their time? Well, young man, no offense, but if you're a sinner, you have no right to interpret anything in the Bible. You don't. Yeah, let me just let me just say this: the, the Bible claims to be written by holy men of old, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, when I was in college. I had an English class and we took we did poetry. And oftentimes we read poetry from people who were dead. And you know the, the professor would say go home read this poem come back and tell me what you think it means. Okay? That's not the way you approach the Bible. Okay? But people come back with you know 30 students class 30 different interpretation of what it says. Every once in a while they come up, maybe two people will agree with each other. But it comes to the Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. You need the author living inside of you 
inspired by the You know what inspiration means? You do, hold on a second. Do you, know, do you know what inspired means, young man? I don't matter of faith. No, no, no. Do you remember what, do you know what inspired means? Uh, please tell me your definition. Well, the Greek word is two Greek words put together. It means God breathed. So if you have an instrument like a trumpet or a trombone, you blow through it. You are the author of those notes. You're using the trumpet or trombone as an instrument right. in your hand. So men of God, holy men of God, were using instruments in God's hand to write down the Holy Scripture. So you would know what he's like. Okay, so you would know what he's like, what you're like, what he expects out of you, what happened in the past, what's going to happen in the future. And it's all absolute and authoritative. And so the Bible is the inspired word of God. And for you to understand it, you must know the author. And if you're you're not a Christian, you don't know the author. The author is the Holy Spirit. The author lives inside of me. You're down to who's the Christian, who's the not. The author lives inside of me. Now, when I was a sinner, before I became a Christian, 16, almost 17 years ago now, I could not understand the scriptures. I would read it. I would try to understand it, but I couldn't because I didn't have the author. I didn't know the author. I didn't have him living inside. But now I do, and I understand it fine. Now, if we want to discuss what the Bible says in certain situations, we can discuss it, and we can interpret it in context using sound hermeneutics. There's almost 7 billion people in this world. Yep. 2 billion of them claim to be Christian, and yet they fight with each other, claiming to have the same author, and have different, wildly different point of views than you do. So this idea that just because you're a Christian and you believe in God, there's some how you come to the same point of view is ridiculous. I never said that. Never said that. I never said that. Now you you made you had a very important word in your statement right there. They claim to be a Christian. The question is, who actually is a Christian? Well, how do we know? Your point of view, right? No, we know from what the Bible says. From what the Bible says. In First John chapter two. Hold on a second. Anyone that says they're a Christian. Anyone that says they're a Christian. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. First John chapter two, verses three and four. Now by this, are you listening? Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So if someone says, well, I'm a Christian, but they don't keep his commandments, they're a liar. They really don't know Jesus. And John 17, 3, Jesus said, hold on a second, John 17, 3, Jesus said, it's impossible to keep his commandments. No, it does not say that. He is saying, okay, we cannot keep his commandments. At the same time, we said. The Bible never says it's impossible to keep his commandments. Never once. Read the context of, of your quoting 1 John here. I've read 1 John probably 200 times, man. What the context is, okay? take out of context, but you seem to be able to do it. John 17, Three, Jesus said, "This is eternal life, knowing God the Father and the one He has sent." So, if you claim to have, you claim to be a Christian, you claim to have eternal life. You must know the God the Father and the one He has sent. Sure. But if you're not keeping His commandments, you don't know Him. First John one five through seven. First John one five through seven. This is the message we have heard from Him, talking about Jesus, and declaring to you: God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him. That's eternal life. And walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, no darkness at all, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if you want to know you're a Christian, you read the scriptures. So, and 1 John was written. See the duplex here? If we, if, we claim, if we don't have any sin here, then clearly the truth is not in us. And if we do have sin, we're a liar. Because well, 1 John, 1 John, no, no. 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 At the same time, First John, you have to understand who it's written to and who it's written about. Okay, First of all, it's, now we go to the history. Right, it's written to Christians, yes. but it's written to warn them about Gnostics or Gnosticism, yes. which would which teach is special knowledge to some of the early. Well, that's that's one thing they taught, and that's what First John two twenty seven refutes. But First John is also refuting other doctrines of Gnosticism, like saying that Jesus didn't literally come in the flesh, and it says later on in First John three and four that if you say Christ didn't come in the flesh, you're an antichrist. It also also, Gnostics also believe that the flesh that we're in right now itself is literally sinful in of itself. Right. That if you're in, hold on a second, hold on a second, that if you're in the flesh, that if you're in the flesh, you're definitely gonna be evil no matter what. And but you can still be holy because your spirit isn't sinning. Right. And so 1 John 1 8, the one you keep quoting improperly, is refuting that Gnostic concept that you can still can be in sin but not be a sinner. Don't, don't you notice the pattern here though? You want the Bible to be literal when it's Point of view. And then when it doesn't, 
You want the Bible not to be literal, so you want to draw from it. From when have I said it's not literal? When have I said it's not literal? Everything I've talked about is in con. I'm just simply bringing out the historical. You are using verses to support your point of view, quoting them directly, and then when someone argues, you say, this is the word of the Bible, this is what it says. Right, people take verses out of context, so I'm showing the proper context. When something's not what you want, that's when you say, okay, let's step back and look at the historical context. I'm suggesting you do The whole thing supports my historical context. The whole thing, 1 John 1, 5 through 7, 1 John 2, 3 through 4, 1 John 3, 6 through 8. 1 John 3, 6 through 8 says this. Tell me how you twist this, young man. He that practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. I agree with it. He who sins is of the devil. Can I ask you a question, I, sir? For this reason, the Son of God was manifested. One of the purposes for the Son of God coming in the flesh, that he might destroy the works of the devil in your life. Can I, can I ask you a question, You can back up a little bit, then you can ask me a question. I'm not going to because I'm I'm going to take your question then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the Bible says you need to repent of all of your sins and follow Jesus Christ. Isaiah 55, 6 through 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For we were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Second Corinthians 5, 15. And Christ died for all that those who live would live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You know, one of the whole purposes of the cross, you know, we just kind of, the, the, the time of the year where the cross actually happened just passed, and people, a lot of people know about this doctrinal uh, confession about the cross and about the resurrection, but they missed the point of it. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Let me, let me instruct you on something, young people. If you raise your hand impatiently and keep interrupting, I'm never going to come to you. Okay? But if you wait quietly and patiently, I will get to you. I'm not here just... I'm not here just to answer questions. I'm here to preach the Bible. And so I'm going to preach the Bible. Okay? So you need to repent of all of your sins, follow Jesus Christ, obey Him. That's what He commands you to do. The Bible says there's coming a day in which God will judge the world in righteousness. And that's why He commands all men everywhere to repent. Um, all men everywhere to give up their sins because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. What's that? Can I get a selfie? I don't mind. I really do have like a little. I don't, I don't see anything. I see your hand. You have, you have it on backwards. I think I do. I don't know how to do this. What's your question, young lady? Sinner. We're all still sinners, whether or not we're Christian or not. We were born with sin. We're always going to have sin, How do you do but we have to constantly refute it and work against it. So you're not sinless. What's your question? That's not like a statement to me. Uh, why do you keep saying that you're there we go. Because we're going to basically not a sinner? First of all, I haven't said that yet. Have. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. You heard my friends say that, but you haven't heard me say that. No, well, it's true. Well, I. If you would let me give my answer, I would appreciate that. You don't speak for me, okay? My, even my friend who we agree with on just about everything, he doesn't speak for me either. Now, I used to be a fornicator and a drunkard and a potty mouth and a porn watcher and a liar and a thief. Um, in a culture, according to Matthew 5, 28, you know, so I've done a lot of things in the past that I, you know, I'm not pleased we with. I'm ashamed of it. We all have. Uh, even since I've become a Christian, I've sinned against God Absolutely. to my own shame. And, and, but God, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, now keep in mind, he said this to sinners now. In Matthew 5, 48, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. In John 5:14, and John 5:14, he said, he said to sinner, a sinner, go and sin no more. 
Do you think that person did? Lest a worse thing happen to you. But, but do you think that person? In John 8:11, 11, Jesus said, go and sin no more as well. And so we have these, we have these statements in scripture. If all you professing Christians would just humble yourself and be patient and let, you're interrupting every five seconds, young man. You haven't been patient yet. You're interrupting you, everyone else too. I have not interrupted anybody. You, 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 I have not interrupted it's one a, person. It's a, a two-way street. I have not interrupted man. one person you're yet. You're still interrupting me. I was in the middle of responding to what that question it's a was. Okay, I've been talking to you. you can't be I'm not gonna talk to you. You're, no, I'm not gonna talk to you. I haven't interrupted anybody yet. You asked me a question. I'm answering. You interrupt every you five seconds. I asked you a question. Yeah, she asked me a question. I'm answering her question. She asked me. And you're interrupting every five seconds. So yeah, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, him we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Yes, and said, Paul said, and to this end I labor and strive. Yeah, so I, I want you to be presented perfect in Christ. And what does that mean? That means this. It means that your past sins are forgiven of you under the blood of Jesus Christ because you go to him with a humble and contrite and broken heart, submitting your life to him, surrendering yourself to the gospel of Jesus, and he cleanses you of your past sins. And then you live a life of obedience to God. Now, if you sin again in the future, you need to repent of that sin to get cleansing and forgiveness again. That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the Greek word for confess there is, is homologeo. It doesn't mean like you go to a Roman Catholic priest and you go to a wooden booth and say, so this is what I did. So Confession in the Greek means you're agreeing with God. Confession in the Greek means you're saying with God, this sin is despicable, I'm putting it away, I'm not going to do it any longer. Now, sin is different than temptation. I want to apologize first for interrupting you. Because you just did it again. I know, I'm apologizing for it, but I have a serious And you're doing it again? I know, I'm going to keep going until you acknowledge that someone has something else to say other than you. Well, I already explained to you what the rules were for me asking, answering your questions. So now there's rules? Yes, for our dialogue, I'm going to have rules. rules. Well, then I can keep on preaching then. So can I. Well, go ahead, go preach everywhere you want. So as I was saying, there's a difference between sin and temptation. The Bible says Jesus was tempted in all points. Jesus was tempted in all points, just like we were, yet was without sin. Can you answer me? So Christ was tempted in all points, just like we were, yet was without sin. And the Bible says no temptation is overtaking you, except as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. So every time you're tempted, and let's define temptation. Temptation is an opportunity the presented to the mind. Is completely it's an opportunity the presented to the mind to obey God or disobey God. So every time you're tempted, you have an opportunity to obey God. You have an opportunity to disobey God. See, and so what you need to do, you ignore because you have no answer. What you need to do, you, you need to, you, no you need to obey God. The gospel Every the time you're reason, tempted, the you just submit yourself to God, resist the devil, that, that they may that flee, may flee from you. That's what makes the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself. So, in the sight of God, and He will lift you up. I got questions for you. What's your question, man? I got two questions. Well, one at a time. And wait for the answer. But say there's people in here that's not Christian. They're trying to listen to you. How, why aren't you telling them how to come to Christ? I, I think right I think away. they I think they were clapping for him, not, not You're for you. But. Them right away <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Oh, now you asked several questions. This young man asked me for those who are yeah, go over there, go over there if you want to go. Yeah, go, go. So the question is, how, why am I not telling people how to be saved? I am telling people how to be saved. No, no, I said repent therefore and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out, so that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. I said it just a little while ago. You no, know, so it, when, when it comes to the, the Bible, I have to preach the whole counsel of God. I mean, there's people that's genuinely interested in Christ. And yeah, Jesus. sure, and I'm telling them how to be right saved. Away. Right out of the gate, they're going to hell. I don't think I've said that once. I don't even know if I mentioned the word hell yet. 
Well, that, yeah, that's a, that's a biblical concept there, young man. It's, it's telling people who are engaging these things. It's warning. See the warning at the top? Warning them. Or maybe they want to so, sit here and come and be like, hey, how? 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 And well, sure. It says, oh, you're all no, no. The, you you got to read the other side, young man. You got to read the other side, young man. Trust you. Jesus. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. But Jesus doesn't hate sin. He died for our sins. Where does the Bible say hate? Where does it say hate there? It says he hates sin on the other side. Right. He does hate sin. It's a Bible verse. But he died for our sins. Hebrews 1 9 says Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. But he preached to prostitutes and sinners and stuff. He didn't go. I'm preach preaching to sinners too. That's what I'm here to do, young man. I want to preach to people he who are sinners. He preached, he preached acceptance. The Bible, ne Jesus never preached tolerance in the Bible. He preached love. He preached the gospel. Of well, actually, he only mentioned. Did you read the Bible? Jesus was pretty offensive to people who didn't want to hear the truth. Absolutely, he was. He was extreme. He only preached God's love for all of mankind once in all the Bible we have recorded, okay? And he did it to one man, Nicodemus in John 3 16. Okay, so I preach, I would assert to you that in my. What, 30 minutes I've been up here so far? I've preached on the love of God more than Jesus did all whatever we see in the Bible. Okay? So I preach on the love of God, but I also preach on the wrath of God. It's the whole council, man. I can't just preach on one part and not the rest. Can you tell a story about the wrath of God so people can understand like how it is? Well well, I don't know if I can tell a story about it, but you can. you can, it's the flood. Like his family. Okay, well I, I can talk about the flood for a second. Yeah, that was to wipe out lawlessness. Right. That's a good point. Now, now Noah's flood. He promised he would never do it again. Well, with a, with water. Right. But he's gonna do it with fire. What about the um, city? What That's city? She's talking about oh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then his the man, all he just told the, his family for them not to turn around to the city. Right. And he, his wife turned around and she turned into a pillar of salt. That's right. So people think that God is so like Jesus was forgiving. God has a wrath. Like, right. God was an angry God. Well, Jesus has wrath too. Uh, we're not going to separate God because yeah, it's Trinity. It's they're, they're, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Old Testament God is no different than the New Testament God. And the people who got saved in the Old Testament got saved the same way as people in the New Testament. But the Old Testament was by the grace of God. Yeah, well, well, for us to learn from. well, I would agree with that to a, to a, to a, to a, to a, to a point. They sinned against God and turned their backs on them. Right. I would agree with that to a point, young man, that, that, that a lot of the old, like the Deuteronomy law, right. like the ceremony laws, the, the governmental laws, the clothing laws, the dietary laws, those, I'm a Gentile. Those don't apply to me. Right, but it's, okay, under a new covenant. It's, it's his, it's put in the... Well, well his, his whole purpose in that dispensation, if you would call it that, was that he would bring the Messiah through the Jewish people. And so when he would say to Abraham, your seed, it was singular. A lot of Bible is translated as descendants, but a seed was singular. It was talking about Jesus Christ. Paul talks about this in Galatians. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And when he, when uh, God said to the serpent, right after Adam and Eve sinned, he said, um, I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's. He shall crush your head, you shall bruise his heel. That's like one of the first prophecies about Jesus. He's the one who crushed the devil's head because he, he made a way for the captives to go free. He made a way for them to be saved right, because, because there's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. And the Jews turned their back on Jesus too. Right, and the Bible talks about that in Romans 11. It says, therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God. But they were on God's the, chosen people when they killed his son. They killed right, right. Not all of them did. Not all of them did. The, 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 laws the leaders did. Our sins killed his son. No, actually, literally, literally speaking, the the Jewish they leaders are the one, and and Pontius Pilate didn't want nothing to do it. He he said, "I wash my hands of this. I want." He wanted to set him free, and so and they even said, "Let his blood be upon our our hands and our our, our children's hands." That's what that's what they said. Um, now I will give you the point that that of course one of the reasons Christ came is that he might die for our sins. So obviously the ultimate overarching purpose was Christ dying for our sins, but from their perspective, they put him to death. And it's affirmed over and over again in the scriptures. Um, but when it comes to like um, uh, the, the laws in the Old Testament, those are applicable to Jewish people for the most part. But when it comes to the moral law of God, there's a lot of moral laws when it comes to the There's a lot of moral laws in the Old Testament that are reaffirmed in the New Testament. In fact, they even go deeper. And like in Matthew 5 20, Jesus said, You've heard it said of all, you should not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her. And so, but the Bible says adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we shouldn't be looking at lust with lust at women at all because that makes us in danger of hellfire. Mix is in danger of God's judgment and his punishment. And we don't want that. We don't we don't want to get what we deserve from God. 
We want to get what we don't deserve from God, which is His grace and His mercy. But God took Mary Magdalene and took her from prostitution and made her uh, walk with Him. Actually, that's that's a myth. Mary Magdalene was never a prostitute. Uh, it's unknown. You don't no, know she was. John unknown. John eight. Well, it's never affirmed either. But John eight. But you is, don't know for sure. Either. John John eight is. So don't speak with the assurance when you don't know. It's not John, John 8, which people often not assume is Mary Magdalene, not, does not say Mary Magdalene. It was the adulterer. Yeah, but Mary Magdalene never said, it does say of her that she was delivered of seven demons. It says that. But never says that she was uh, an adulterer or adulteress. It never says she was a prostitute. That's assumed by people. I think they might be getting it from the, the gospel of Mary Magdalene, which is a really a Gnostic false gospel. Um, but uh, so Jesus offers you mercy and kindness and forgiveness if you'll forsake all of your sins. There is no if. There is an if. You must forsake all your sins. Jesus died for our sins. Though. Yeah, but you must forsake all your sins. Right. You can but forsake his, them all his, you want. So listen, his forgiveness is not applied to everybody just because he died on the cross. Jesus sure does. It's all for them. Why not? It's, it's, it's only... Your heart, your desire to sin is gone. It's a, but it's, that doesn't mean you won't. It's a, it's all, the, you what Christ did on the cross is only applicable to those who forsake their sins and trust in Him and follow Him. You, 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 must, sin. you must forsake your you sins and follow Him. It's, it's that's, still, that's your only hope, young man. It's, it's a give, I, don't know, I don't know what your sins may be, but you need to give them it's all up and follow Jesus. And He will never lead you wrong. He will that's, never that's, lead you astray. He will lead you to the kingdom of God, but the devil will lead you straight to hell. Your sin will lead you to hell. Give it up, man. Sin is assured. It's not implied. Yeah, sure is. The devil is just a creature. He's He's created by God. So, I mean, he wasn't created in that state. He made himself that way, but he is a creature of God. He's not a crutch. He's a stretcher. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you walk according He's to the Spirit, you will not fulfill the he lust of the flesh. So you don't have to I sin. I, I mean, think about it for a second. A God condemns people for sin. If, they, it was, if it was impossible to live above sin, God would be unjust in condemning them for it. But He is just. And the reason He condemns people for their sins is because they ha it, was, it was avoidable. They could have done otherwise. And that's the reason they're guilty. I mean, if you put a dog on the highest building here and said, dog, fly. Would that be just? No more. He has no ability to fly, right? So for God to say, sinner, psh, get into hell, I couldn't but sin. That wouldn't be just. Exactly, and that's and so that's the conviction. So that's why you need to walk with God. That's right. You know, obey God. There is no. How do you walk with God? Okay, well, temptation comes. Because you're going to be tempted. That's one. That's the first thing you need to realize. At all. Throw it away, man. Put it in the garbage. It's going to kill you. Okay. Kill you. Do you but but McDonald's? temptation comes. That's worse for you than that. Young man, I'm talking to him. Can you I'm stop? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to him. I'm trying to speak the love to you. Like you don't. I don't think you even know what love is, young man. I don't think. But you temptation either. is when an opportunity is presented to the mind. To either obey God shadow of or doubt. disobey God. So the first thing you must realize is that temptation is going to come. If you have wrong expectations, you'll never overcome sin. Okay? You'll never so overcome sin as long as you Temptation is going to come. Your and you must realize, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken us. All right, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. All right. Say she, I'm sorry to use your example, but her boots. She likes her boots, right? Huh? But is that coveting? Is that lust for her boots? No, liking something is not coveting. Uh, liking, coveting is something, desiring something of, that you should not have or does not belong to you. And, and, and in the, uh, Exodus 20, where that's first quoted, Okay, when it talks about the 10th commandment, which is what it is, it says, do not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's oxen. These are things that don't belong to that person. Okay? Or if you if you sin to acquire something. Like if, if say you're you're working all your hours and you take your money instead of paying your bills or buying food for your family, you take it and go buy a, a car that you shouldn't have had in the first place. That'd be coveting as well. Okay, so if you if you're being sinful in your the way you're acquiring it, or um, Desiring something that doesn't belong to you, that's when it becomes sinful. Okay, covenant. But temptation that comes to you, young man, you must realize, according to 1 Corinthians 10 13, that no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So, whatever temptation you go through, other people in the world have gone through that or even are going through it right now. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when your temptation comes, realize 
that it's it's not too hard for you to handle with Jesus. All right, can I ask another question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, she risks her life every day, right? Huh? Say she. Like, I don't know if she does or not. She does, does she? They risk their lives every day. But say she wants to treat herself, right? She <laughs> spa, whatever. Is that lust because she wants to, she risks her life? No, I don't think so. Enjoying enjoying something is not it's not lust. Like uh, in, enjoying a. Uh, so he enjoys cigarettes. Enjoy that? enjoy a game with with your friends that's not sinful in of itself. That that wouldn't be uh, that wouldn't be lust either. Um, oftentimes, one of the reasons why people think we can't overcome sin, they make things into sin that really aren't sin. Well, can you give an example? Um, yes, temptation. People think temptation oftentimes is sin. Uh, for example, let's say someone's walking down this right here. And a girl walks by that's wearing clothing that's exposing herself in ways that she shouldn't be. And he looks at her chest. Okay? Looking at her chest in and of itself is not a sin. It's not a sin. But once you allow that thought to perpetuate in your mind and you begin to think about her sexually and you desire her in that way, that's when it becomes lust and becomes sin. Okay? Uh, or even, you know, when you become a Christian, you may have some ex-girlfriends you've done stuff with that you should have done stuff with. I know I did. And I'd be riding down the road, just driving, all of a sudden, I thought it would just pop in my mind. I wouldn't be thinking about this person. It just popped in my mind of these past things I did with them. But I didn't give myself over to that thought. I took that thought captive, like 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. So I took it captive to the obedience of Christ so I wouldn't sin. So there's times people call things sin that really aren't sin. And uh, that's one of the reasons why sometimes people think they can't overcome sin in this life. It's laid out. It's not really, I mean, sin is black and white in general, wrong and right. But right. Yeah, there's a lot of gray area when it comes to people talking about sin. Right. It, it, there, may, there may be some things that may be a sin for you that are not for me. For example, if, if you became a Christian and God said, what's your name? David. David. He said, David, go to Africa and be a missionary. And, but, he ha but he hasn't told me that. If you don't obey that, it'd be a sin for you. All right. But it wouldn't be a sin for me not to go to Africa because God hasn't called me to go there. Right. Okay, so that's, there's a difference there. Uh, some people, God may say, because they have a past problem with watching pornography, they may say, well, God may say, don't have a computer at all in your house. That doesn't mean it's a sin for me to have a computer. It's a sin for them. Yeah, because God's, you know, as you walk with God, he, t he reveals things to you that you need to change so you can keep on walking with Him. Okay, but it, as He reveals things to you, you say, you know what, God, I'm not going to do that. Now you're back in sin. Now you're back in trouble. And so you need to, as you walk in the Spirit, the Bible says you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah. Yeah, no problem, David. You do. You're up here working hard, man. Is there anything I can do for you? Can I get you something to eat or drink? Do you need anything? No, I'll pass. Thanks. You listen a lot, Barry. I don't want to disrespect your friend, but he didn't listen to the questions. He just well, if you put you put yourself in our shoes, if there's 100 people around us and 50 of them are asking this question at the same time, and you only have two ears, how, how easy is it to listen? I mean, And plus, my friend is, is in his 50s. He was in the Navy for 20 years, and he has bad hearing. So that makes it even more difficult for him. I don't have that problem. I don't have a limitation like that. What do you have water for that? Thank you, too, David. What's your name, ma'am? My name is can, Kerrigan. Can I ask? I mean, is that okay? Yeah, you can ask my name. My name is Kerrigan. Okay. Is there anything I can pray for you about? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? No. You're doing just fine. You can, you can pray for me to continue to walk in holiness before God. To continue to not give in to temptation, to be pure in my thought life, to lead my family properly, to love my wife and my children the way I should, to lead the church the way I should. You can pray those things for me. That's, that's What's something your I, name? My name is Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Can, yeah. I go, can, I, can I do that now? No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to pray in public. I mean, I don't want to do it to be a show to man. I mean, you want, I'm not doing it to be a show to well, man. But I, I'm, here to, I'm here to preach, man. I'm not here, I'm not here to pray. You can, you can pray I'm, for me on your own time in your closet, I, I will. like Matthew 6 talks about. And, uh, it's not a literal closet that it talks about, but I will do that. Well, I'm being figurative when I say that. I'm just quoting the Bible. Well, I love you, man, and man, I will pray for you. Okay. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. So God commands all men everywhere to repent. Because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. God is going to judge this world in righteousness. The Bible says, do not be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals nor sodomites, nor covetous, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit 
the kingdom of God. Young people, if you're on that list I just read off or just quoted off from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, you're in great danger. If you think you can be a fornicator or a drunkard and be on your way to the kingdom of God, you are deluded. The Bible makes it clear the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So what do you do? Well, stop being unrighteous. Start being righteous. Start obeying God. Give up all of your sin and follow Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing happen to you. And if you continue in sin, no matter what your sin is, whether it's lying or stealing or covetousness or drunkenness or porn watching or lust, whatever your sin is, if you continue in it, you're in great danger. You're in great danger. For a time will come, and the Bible talks about this in Jude 14 and 15, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's Jude 14 and 15. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied that. The one who walked with God and was no more. That's what he said. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, it says, When Christ returns with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these he shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of God of his power. So those who don't know God, those who don't obey the gospel, when Christ returns with his mighty angels, he will punish them with everlasting destruction. Now of course it's not God's will for you. It's not God's will for you to go to hell. It's not God's will for you to end up in the lake of fire and go to hell forever. The Bible says God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. God wants you to turn and live. Doesn't want you to die and go to hell for your sins. But as long as you remain a sinner, you are currently on the path to destruction. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says this, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Will you be a part of the many, or a part of the few? The many, which is most of the world, are on the broad path that leads to destruction. Look around, you young people. If you're acting just like the rest of the world, living like the rest of the world, you're on the broad path that leads to destruction. You need to get off that and get on the narrow path, which leads to life. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 says, There is no other name given under heaven by which man must be saved except Jesus Christ. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, 
the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And we're here today to testify to you about this man named Jesus Christ, who is a ransom for all, ransom for you to deliver you from your sins, to deliver you from judgment, to deliver you from guilt and condemnation. But when Christ delivers somebody, <clears throat> He delivers them not just from the guilt and punishment of sins, but also from the practice and committing of sins. Christ is that powerful. Christ is powerful enough to deliver you from your actual sins. <clears throat> if you'll let Him, if you'll surrender your life to Him, you can have eternal life through what He did for you on the cross. But He's your only hope. He's the only mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. His name is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Christ shed His blood for you that you might have forgiveness of sins. That you might be saved. Yes, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. And that's where you come into play, young people. You might be saved if you'll surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Might be saved. But you might not be saved if you choose to continue to walk in sin, if you continue to choose to continue to be a fornicator and a drunkard or a liar or a thief, you will not have eternal life. You will not be saved. I'm going to put this down. Okay, fine. I just wrap it up and set it up by three, it'd be fine. That can do it. Can I pause it? No, you don't have to pause it. I can hear that later. Do you have your Bible? Do I have my Bible? Yeah, can I ask you to read uh, a couple of your scriptures? I'm just curious how your Bible, what translation your Bible uses. Hold on, hold on a second in there. Sure, that's fine. I'm actually going to start preaching again. I'm just... Putting, no, putting this away. That's, I gotta get going anyway, but I, just, I was just curious. Uh, what, what Bible verse are you referring to? Um, James 3.6, Psalm 9.17, and Psalm 16.10-11. Psalm 9.17 says the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God, I believe. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very close to that. And I was just wondering, uh, for the translation's sake, uh, I'm, I'm uh, about hell itself, the word hell. Okay, well, there's, there's uh, different words that are translated as hell. Yeah, Gehenna, Sheol, Hades. Well, Sheol is the Old Testament. Yeah, Sheol is Okay, the Old but New Testament, you have uh, Gehenna, Hades, um, and also Tartarus one time. Yeah. Uh, Gehenna is the final resting place, well, resting place, but the final destination of the, of the wicked, okay? Hades is the abode of both the wicked and the righteous after they die. That's where they get resurrected from. Okay, Tartarus is the place for the worst, the false teachers, the fallen angels, they will go to Tartarus, which is called, also called the blackness of darkness forever, and I think it's believed believe on 1 Peter. So uh, I, I think a, a Bible that translates Hades as hell is incorrect. Yeah. It's actually supposed to be Hades. Mm -hmm. And it's synonymous with Sheol in the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay. Now in the Old Testament, synonymous with, with hell would be the pit. Uh, or something similar. I can't remember the other Hebrew word, but I mostly focus on the New Testament when it comes to this stuff. But um, Hades is not the same place as Gehenna. 
Gehenna is synonymous with the Lake of Fire. Yeah, that's what I would say. I was, just, I was just curious about your translation of yeah. your definition. The New King James Version translates it properly. They translate Hades as Hades. Mm -hmm. like Gehenna as hell. That's what it does. So I, I, that's why one of the reasons I like the New King James Version above the King James Version, because it actually translates those things properly. You know, if, I, if there was a city called hell in Michigan, and a city called hell in Ohio, and I say I'm going to hell, but I was going to hell Michigan, you thought I was going to hell Ohio, it wouldn't make any sense to you. Yeah. But if I say hell Michigan, you say, oh, there's a hell in Michigan too? And I say, yes. I was just curious because the Gehenna was the city with like the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. The Valley of Hinnom. Yeah. Right? But that, that's just using, Jesus is just using a word picture to describe what hell's going to be like. Gehenna. Yeah, so it, it was perpetual fire burning there, burning garbage. It's also the place where in Old Testament, the, the backslidden Israelites sacrificed their children to Moloch. Yeah. Yeah, so... Obviously, you don't want to be. You don't want to go to that place. Yeah. I was just curious about your translation. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. James chapter one. Verse 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. And that's what you need to do, young people. Lay aside, repent of, surrender all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Many people, they hear God's word, but they don't do it. And the Bible says when you hear God's word and don't do it, you deceive yourselves, and the truth is not in you. James says it's like someone who looks in the mirror and walks away and forgot what he looked like. He's like a person who looks in the perfect law of liberty and does not obey it or keep it. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he will enter in. That's the one he went in. And he goes on to say, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine does not do them. I will liken him to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. If you hear the sayings of Jesus and you do not do them, you're like the man who built this house upon the sand. But if you hear the sayings of Jesus and do them, he likens you to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. When the trials of life will come, you will stand. When the 
great trial of judgment day will come. You will stand because your house is built upon the rock, because you heard Christ's words, and you're obeying them. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15 says this, Blessed are those who do the commandments of God, that they might have the right to the tree of life, and might enter through the gates into the city. But outside of the city are the dogs, the sexy immoral, sorcerers, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a law. Blessed are those who do the commandments of God, that they might have the right to the tree of life and might enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs, the sorcerers, murderers, idolaters, the sexually immoral, and whoever loves and practices a law. Bible says in Matthew 13 that Christ will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Bible said the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. For those who practice lawlessness will be cast into the furnace of fire, and the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Repent, sinner. Repent, sinner. The Bible says, for this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any 
inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Don't be deceived, young people. You can't be a fornicator and enter God's kingdom. You can't be an unclean person and enter God's kingdom. You can't be covetous or an idolater and enter God's kingdom. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of those things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Are you a son of obedience? Or are you a son of disobedience? If you're still living in sin, by definition, you're a son or daughter of disobedience, and therefore the wrath of God is upon you. But Christ can save you from the wrath of God. He can save you from judgment and hell. He can save you from sin if you'll submit your life to him. If you'll give your life to Jesus Christ, he can save you, he can change you. The Bible says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Are you the same old sinner you were from before you say you became a Christian? For the Bible says, anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Romans 6, verse 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been free from sin. So if you're a Christian, the old man has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been free from sin. Christ can set you free from sin. Jesus said in John 8, in John chapter 8, Jesus said, Yeah, what's your question? What message are you trying to deliver? But I think it's pretty clear. I'm just preaching the Bible. Yeah. So that, you're trying to tell people like, that we're going to all go to hell? Or well, I, I'm not telling everybody they're going to hell. The shoe fits where? If you're in sin, you're on your way to hell currently. Well, you can repent of it. That's why I said you're on, you're on your way to hell currently. That's why I've called people to repentance. Exactly. So, you repent, and then there comes judgment day, right? Judgment day is going to come, yep. Uh, well, once you die, it's too late. Once you die, or judgment day comes, it's too late. There's no, uh, there's no hope then. It's what the Bible says. Today's the day of salvation. If you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Today's the day of salvation. You need to repent today. You may not have tomorrow. Yeah, it's a point a man wants to die, and after this comes the judgment. But I don't want you to be judged by God. I want you to get mercy from God. Judgment Day is not Mercy Day. Judgment Day is Judgment Day. Yeah, judgment Day is not Forgiveness Day. Judgment Day is Judgment Day. No mercy, no forgiveness given out on Judgment Day. Just judgment. And so, you need to get right with God today. Give up all of your sin today while you still have time. That's why the Bible says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Yes. There will come a point in time where you'll no longer be able to seek God. There will come a point in time when Christ is no longer near. But today, while it's called today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as the Jewish people did in rebellion in, in the wilderness. And they died. They were not allowed to go into the promised land that he given to Abraham because they departed from God. They hardened their hearts. They didn't obey God. 
They did not enter in because they didn't obey, because of unbelief. And even the, the Jews in the New Testament, the Bible says, therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So there's severity for sinners. There's goodness for saints, but severity for sinners. Don't be a sinner. There's no good reason to be a sinner. Not one. Not one good reason in this world. Not one good reason in the next world to be a sinner. The Bible says, What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul in the end? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone's ashamed of me and my words, the adulterers of sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. God commands you to be holy. He commands you to repent. He commands you to give up your sin. And if you don't do it, God will give you what you deserve. But today, Today, He's offering you what you don't deserve. He's offering you eternal life. He's offering you forgiveness today. If you'll surrender everything to Him, humble yourself, and He will lift you up. The Bible says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God and He will lift you up. That's James 4.8. That's James 4.8. God bless you guys. So you need to draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning, your joy to gloom. Doesn't sound pleasant to the flesh, does it? Let your laughter return to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and He will lift you up. Isaiah 1 says, Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient. If you are willing and obedient. At the end of Ecclesiastes, song, Solomon writing here, one of the wisest men who ever lived, says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. That's Bible. So the Bible says. It also says to preach of love, faith, hope, and Passion, Where does it say that, young man? Give me a give me a quote from that from a Bible. Okay, how about Mark 28 to 31 or 12, 28 to 31, where Jesus himself says, um, talks about the most important commandments, asks of which is the most important. Yeah, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and friend, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Now what is love, the young man? Define love for me. Define love? Define love, yes. Okay, tell me what love is. Well, I'm asking you to define it, young man. He's asking you. Well, I'm not the you, don't have, you don't have a definition for love? I want to hear a definition for love, actually. Well, I understand your definition. What's my definition? That a Savior came from heaven and... Well, that's, that's God demonstrating His love for sinners. Romans 5, 6, 3. That's what it says. Sure. God demonstrates His own love towards us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But I'm talking about love between humans now. It seems like that's what you're, you're coming against. You're saying, it seems like you're saying I'm not being loving. 
Uh, love for people, person to person, is wanting their greatest good. Okay? Even at the cost of my own good. All right? So I, I want the greatest good for everybody here, man, including yourself, that they forsake all of their sins, they trust in Jesus, and they follow him the rest of their days. So I'm here to proclaim that message to you, that you might be saved, that I might influence you in that direction, but yet you still have free will. You can choose to continue to be a sinner, or you can choose to follow Jesus Christ. That's your choice. But I'm here to love for you. I, you know, I, dro I drove four hours today to get here. You know, I, I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning. I didn't have to do that. I spent my own time. I could be working. I could be making money. I could be spending time with my family. But I, I'm showing love towards you by coming here to tell you the truth that you might be saved. Sure. And that's true love. But, but love, love for people is not telling them you can be a sinner and go to heaven and pat them on the back and they go off to hell. Love is not saying everyone's okay with God when they're not. Love is not just preaching about the good news. It's preaching the bad news too. And so if I love you, I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. I'm going to preach the good stuff, grace, mercy, cross. I'm going to preach the bad stuff, hell, judgment, and uh, the law, and sin. I'm going to preach those things as well. So it would be better to guilt people and to fear people into heaven than to instead preach happiness, love, and uh, grace, well, and mercy? Well, what do you mean by better? What makes people feel better or what is actually is better? What is the best thing to do is to do it the way God did it. And the Bible says God opposes the Bible says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's a biblical principle, so that's what I do. So when someone is pride about prideful about their sin, they're prideful about their sin, I'm gonna give them the law. And judgment in hell, which is what Jesus did. But someone humbles himself, I'm gonna give them grace, mercy, and the cross. That's a biblical principle. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so that's what I'm going to do. And so, if you mean by better, it's better to make them feel all good about themselves when they actually shouldn't feel good. Because God gave you a conscience. I love Satan. You know right and right from wrong. Sure. And so when I tell, when you uh, do something wrong, your conscience tells you it's wrong, you should feel guilty about it. That's a God-given function that God put in you from the beginning, from your mother's womb. God gave you this. What happens when someone has a belief system contrary to yours and they don't feel guilt and they don't feel... Uh, you know, like they're doing something bad or wrong. What if they feel peace? And what if they feel happiness and love? And well, well, the Bible says that you can corrupt your conscience. You can defile your conscience. You can sear your conscience. Um, if you ever had a steak that was seared, it's got a crust on the outside, right? It's got a hard crust, but it's still maybe medium rare inside. People can sear their conscience. They can corrupt it to the point where it doesn't work anymore. Um, I used to have an alarm clock that if I hit the snooze bar enough times, it would stop coming on. So those people are just sociopaths then. They have... Well, I didn't say they're a sociopath, but... no difference between right and wrong. They have... No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that, but you, you told me they don't they feel... They're their conscience. We, they, you, they don't from, your, from what you gave me, the scenario you gave me, they don't feel bad when they sin. Yeah, so they've seared their conscience. Doesn't mean they're a sociopath. It means that whatever sin you're referring to, maybe it's lying. Maybe they think they don't feel bad when they lie anymore. Well, then they're a pathological liar. They're in trouble. They're in great danger because they're to the point where they think lying is okay. Or if someone's uh, having sex outside of marriage, they've gotten to the point where they think that's okay. When they've known from the beginning it wasn't okay, but they've told themselves to the, by continuing to practice it that it is okay and ignore their conscience, guess what? Their conscience isn't going to work as good as it used to anymore. So a religious person anywhere can perform can, or a non-religious person, can they just not have a conscience then? No, everyone's born with a conscience. Everyone was born with God's law written upon their heart. So everyone knows right from wrong. But people can reject that. It's only an influence. It doesn't cause you to live holy. It doesn't make you obey. So like the law of the land. You know that people know rape is wrong. You know they go to jail for it. They caught, but they still do it, don't they? People know murder is wrong, but they still do it. So. Having a conscience and having the law of God written upon your heart does not necessitate you obeying it. It's only it's like me. I'm an influence. I'm trying to influence you in the right direction by telling you the word of God and telling you the truth. Now, do you have to obey it? No, you don't have to obey it. But you, you can obey it. And the Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth in the life. So I'm here to preach Jesus to you. Um, you know, the Bible says that um, all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. You know, so you need Jesus.
Oh, so what makes your religion correct over everyone else's? It's the truth. How do you know? How do I know? Well, that, that would depend on what kind of evidence or proof you're looking for, young man. Any. Okay, well, if you're looking for like empirical proof, have you, have you read the Bible? Oh yeah. So, yeah okay, well, that, that's proof right there. This is God, this Anyone is... Write a book? Well, young man, you saying that tells me you really haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible has prophecies in it, that things that were predicted to happen that happened hundreds, even a thousand years later. No to a, did prophecies and he's considered a sinner. Have you ever read Nostradamus? I have. Well, if, if you have, you would see that it, his prophecies were so vague and so ambiguous, people can apply it whenever they want to apply it. But when you have the Bible, you have over 300 messianic prophecies about Jesus, and he fulfilled them. And so, uh, things that, like for example, that his his uh, his hands would be pierced, and no bones would be broken when he would die. That he would die, but he would die in the midst of transgressors and be buried in a rich man's tomb. These are the kind of things that the scripture talks about over a thousand years before these things actually happened, and before the crucifixion was even invented as a punishment device. And so, if you want empirical evidence, that's empirical evidence. But I would say that that. Christianity is true because the impossibility of the contrary. It has to be true. There's no other way it can be. I don't have any water left. Sorry. All right. Yeah, so Jesus is going to judge you. Uh, Jesus is going to return and judge your life, and you need to prepare yourself. You need to be ready to meet your Maker. You need to be ready to stand before Jesus Christ to give an account for every thought, word, and deed. The Bible says that he'll judge even the secret things that are done in darkness. The things that no one else knows about, Jesus Christ will judge you for those things. You know, when you, when you have lustful thoughts that go through your mind, God knows about those things. Other people may not know about those things, but God does. And God's going to judge you for those things. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom he must give an account. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked, uncovered, open to the eyes of him. Why are you mocking, young man? You are mocking. You, you professed to be a Christian earlier, now you're a mocker. You're a, that's not what I said, you weren't listening. They don't listen to <laughs> There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom he must give an account. God knows about your sin, sinners. He knows all about your thought life, the words that come out of your mouth, the way you live your life, the things you do, and he's going to bring it into judgment. He's going to condemn you for your sin if you don't repent. If you don't give up your sin, surrender your sin, surrender your life to God, he will give you what you deserve. God is holy, God is just, and God is going to punish sin and sinners. And if you're a sinner, you're not ready. As I said earlier, do not be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither fornicators. Now a fornicator is someone who has sex outside of marriage. Well, we have, we have a professing fornicator over here. Yeah, well, hell is not a cuss word, sinner. Hell is a place you're going if you don't repent. Yeah. I'm not going there. I'm holy. I obey God. I keep his commandments. Down there. I won't be there. And we'll hang out with Satan. No, sinner. There's no hangouts in hell, sinner. There's no party in hell. The party's been canceled due to the fire. The party's been canceled due to the fire. It's been canceled. See? Everybody wants to go. Do you know? 
You know that? Be cool, man. Did you know that that uh, alcohol is flammable? <laughs> Try drinking a beer when you're on fire. See what happens. Beer doesn't catch on fire, you dumbass. <laughs> it's flammable, sinner. Beer is flammable. No, it's not. It's alcohol. It's flammable. The rules in hell are different. <laughs> What'd you say? Beer, beer actually beer isn't puts, puts it out. Oh, okay. It happens every Okay, well, one knows. I'm wrong. You're a sinner. Yeah. No, uh, being wrong does not make you a sinner. You're going to hell. No, being wrong, sinning makes you a sinner. Is it, being, is it sin the epitome of being wrong? No, is that what I mean? If I get an answer wrong on a test, that means I'm a sinner. That's getting something wrong. At least you're dumbass. No, it doesn't mean I'm dumb. It just means I was an error. You've never been an error in anything in your life, young man? I was wrong the first time I thought I was wrong. How does that good? Yeah. But you, you can be saved, young man. You can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. If... No, you don't. My relationship between Jesus... You're a potty mouth. The only relationship you have with Jesus is he's your judge. He's your judge and you're a sinner on your way to hell. That's the only relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm judging you too. The Bible says saints will judge the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I am a saint. I am a saint. So I am, yes. Not a Catholic saint. I don't want you praying to me and wearing me around your neck on a necklace. Okay? I am a biblical saint. I obey God. What saint is? No praise in the rosary, that's, that's idolatry. But the Greek word for saint is hagias. A holy one. A one who's separated unto God and from sin. Why am I going to hell because I follow Catholicism? When did I say that? Uh, he did. You guys want to move? And he did to my friend over there, which is uh, right over there. I want to know. No, seriously, I would like to know why. I'm not trying to end. Do you obey God? Yes. Do you sin every day? I, I'm going to sin. I well, then you're not obeying God. Do you sin? Can't be perfect. No, I sure don't. You never sin. I obey God. You never sin. Sin. I didn't say I've never sinned. Oh, no, you said that you don't friend. sin. Do you know what it means? Present tense. Have you sinned today? No, I have not sinned today. He did. No, not sinned today. And I don't plan on ever sinning again either. Catholics are going to hell. Don't plan on ever sinning again either. So says the potty mouth. So says the potty mouth. Let no no, no filthy communication proceed forth from your mouth. Colossians chapter 3. That is in the way you use it. Huh? It's the way you use it? The Bible is a book. So, devices apply yeah, to literature. Let me let me put that in there. One and second, so what you church do you go to? About. The Catholic Church was the first okay. church. But you yourselves are to put off all these things: anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Filthy language out of your mouth. Put it away. Put it off. Get rid of it. I'm, not I'm talking about what the young man said, and you're defending him doing that. Yes, so I'm talking to you about what he did. People do what they want. They have free will. You have Well, I don't want them to go to hell. Obviously, you don't care about them. I don't want them to go to hell. I think you do because you keep telling people. No, that's a warning. That's a warning. It doesn't seem like a warning. Well, it seems like a precursor to what you think is a precursor. I am, yes. I'm attacking their sinks. I don't want them to go to hell. But being Catholic is not a sin. Well, it depends on what you mean by that. that Are you following Roman Catholic doctrine? Yes. Well, then, yes, that's, that's sin. That's wow. sinful, yes. How is that sinful? Because there's lots of things the Roman Catholic Church teaches that it's not biblical. Was church. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. No, it's, it's, actually, it's actually an apostasy of the first church. Peter was never a pope. Peter was married. Peter was not even the, the, uh, the main leader. In Acts chapter 15, we have the council in Jerusalem, and the apostle Peter was not even the leader of that council. But you're going to have me believe that he was the leader of all the church. Not only that, but the apostle Paul got the Rome before the apostle Peter did. So if anyone was going to be the bishop of Rome or the head of all the church, it would be him. But when, when, when Jesus said to, 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 Matt, uh, to uh, Peter, uh, you, are, you are the rock. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build a church. He wasn't talking about Peter being the rock he built a church upon. 
Christ. He's not building his church upon a man. He's building his church upon himself. I have a question. He's the foundation. He is the chief cornerstone. Jesus says to love everybody. I do love everybody. No, you love that everybody's going to hell. That's the only I don't love that. If I loved that, I wouldn't even bother coming here. If I loved you were going to hell, I would just stay home and let you go to hell. I wouldn't bother warning you. You guys don't believe any slight. You guys believe any slight. Well, so says you. From your point of view, means that we're not of God, and now we're of Satan, and we're going to hell. Young man, it, you, we've already talked to you quite a bit. Well, keep you, talking, please. You are of Satan because you're a sinner. Satan. You have your father the devil. I'm the father. Yes, you are too. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. I have in the past. Not anymore, though. You you you've never sinned. Today. I have. No, I haven't sinned today. Ask your question. No, you may not. No. First John chapter three and verse six, verse seven. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. That describes you, sir. Well, so says a sinner. So says a sinner. Like, you know what you're talking about. Yes. Every single one so of you're gonna, no, 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 you need to stop being a sinner, young man. I told you this before. You need to stop being a sinner. You need to forsake all of your sin. If you don't forsake your sin, you're forsaking eternal life. You're forsaking Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus Christ in my heart. But he didn't tell you to accept him to his heart. That's why he died on the cross. He never says, accept me into your heart. He, confessed him with he says, repent or perish. Repent or perish. Well, if you confess Jesus as Lord, that means you obey him. If someone's your Lord, you obey him. If you sin against him every day, he's not your Lord by definition. And if he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. You never say Says who? You know all the rules and you do exactly what you're supposed to do. You haven't sinned. So we shouldn't obey God? We shouldn't obey God? We shouldn't obey God? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So, so who loves Jesus out here? Who's actually keeping God's commandments? If you're sitting every day, don't raise your hand. If you're sitting every day, don't raise your hand because you're not keeping his commandments. You're the exact opposite of keeping his commandments. No, he didn't say that. In fact, he says, be perfect as your, he your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, 48, two sinners, he said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's what he said. Deal with it. You need to deal with that. And John 5, 14, Jesus said, go and sin no more. And John 8, 11, Jesus said, go and sin no more. He didn't mean, he didn't mean go and sin some more. He didn't mean go and sin every single day. He meant what he actually said, go and sin no more. That's what he said. And that's what you ought to do. And the Bible says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lusts, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So God commands you to be holy as he is holy. He commands you to be obedient children. Not conform yourself to your former lusts, but to obey him. If you think it's impossible to obey God, you're not a Christian. That's all there is to it. Hey, you want to go get a beer? No, sir. I stopped drinking a long time ago. Oh. Yeah. So if you think it's impossible to obey God, you're not a Christian. Because if you think it's impossible to obey God, that means you're not obeying Him yourself. Which makes you a sinner on your way to hell. So do you have sinless thoughts then? Do I have sinless thoughts? Yes, I have sinless thoughts all the time. I mean, like, all, like every day, every thought you have. I am tempted to sin each and every day that I can recall. You are not sinless because sin is in you. No, sin is not in me. No, I'm pure. I'm pure. I've been purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's cleansed me of all my sins. At, uh, 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's cleansed me from all unrighteousness. And now I obey Him. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little trouble is in the right that you may not sin. Yeah, you shouldn't be sinning. 
But if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Hey man, I just have one question. That's when you say uh, you, you're tempted and that you don't sin in First John, verse eight, one eight. I'm sure you. I'm sure you'll come up with some kind. Of I I went over this a little while ago, young man. Basically, that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I can't see how it comes any more straightforward. But why don't you read the two verses before that, young man? How about verse five? This is the message we heard from him declaring to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we claim, if we claim that you're not listening, if we claim to have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, that's you, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, no darkness at all, you're not even listening. Then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It can't get any clearer than that. Of course, you weren't listening, so you wouldn't have heard it. But 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly... The love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know we are in Him. How do we know we know Him? How do we know we're in Him? How do we know we have fellowship with Him and saints? How do we know we have the blood of Christ cleansing from all sin? If we're walking in the light, if we're keeping His commandments, if we're walking just as He walked. So you can take verse 8 and twist it to mean something else and reject the rest of 1 John, young man, all you want. But for you to take... For you take a holy Bible, written down by holy men of old, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and try to justify your unholy living is nonsense. Man, I've been listening to accurate. Did you take did you You haven't listened to one thing I said? You've been getting distracted, turning left and right. You listen to anything I've said. Not one thing. I'm full of the word of God. You call that SHIT, that's on you. Okay? Have you told anyone today that Yes. I'm, I'm not shaking your hand. You're out of here, man. Get out of here, you mocker. You better repent before you go to hell. You hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You're not a Christian. You're a hypocrite. This is love. You're a hypocrite. Woe to you, hypocrite. Have a whitewashed tomb full of dead man's bones. Woe to you, hypocrite. Yeah, just like in Matthew 23, when Jesus had the love for the fairies, the same kind of love I have for you. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. As many of them are rebuking children. I wish through nothing, therefore be zealous and repent. Yes, you need to repent, sir. You're a hypocrite. You try to take a holy Bible, written by holy men of old, inspired by a holy spirit, to try to justify your unholiness. Not going to work, sinner. Not going to work. You're a hypocrite. You're on your way to hell. You need to repent. God loves you, even if you are not like you have that at all. Like you think oh, I just quoted to you, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. You, you, uh, now I know you're so Christian. biblically illiterate you don't know the Bible when you hear it quoted, but the fact is open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Proverbs 27 5. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Ephesians 5 11. You don't know the Bible. I know it comes out of your mouth. Out of the mouth is the overflow of the heart. You have a filthy heart. You need to repent. Yeah, you need to repent. Have a good one. Yeah. Hey, we pray for him. I, says who? God. Where? He says that only he can judge. Where? Where does the Bible say only God can judge? Where does the Bible say only God can judge? Pull out your smartphone and look it up, young man. Tell me what the Bible says only God can judge. Because 1 Corinthians 2.15 says this. The spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is rightly judged by no man. A spiritual man judges all things, and he himself is rightly judged by no man. 1 Corinthians 6, the saints will judge the world. I'm going to judge the world. You're not a saint, sir. I sure am. You're a saint? Not a Roman Catholic saint, but I'm a saint. I'm a Christian saint. I think you're A biblical saint. The Greek word is hagias. It means holy one, set apart one, set apart from the world and to God. That's what a saint is. Paul wrote to the saints in Thessalonica, the saints in Corinth, the saints in Galatia. He wrote to saints, people who were actually alive. 
between the Roman Catholic saints and just Christian saints? Aren't they both Christian? Well, Christian saints, the right one. Roman Catholic one's the wrong one. Yeah. So Catholicism is wrong now. Of course it is. Of course it is. You thought it was right? Yeah, so Roman Catholic saints, they put them around necklaces and pray to them. The Bible never tells you to pray to people. I pray to God through Jesus Christ, like the Bible says. I don't pray to human beings who were once alive here on earth. They can't hear you. They can't hear you, sorry. They can't hear you. People who have died and gone on can't hear you. You're wasting your words, you're wasting your time. And the Bible says concerning the rosary, don't don't be repetitive about your prayers. For God is not here for your many words. The only one not following vital lesson that Jesus teaches, which is to love everybody, no matter what. Who said I'm not loving people? It doesn't feel sure like it, you're attacking people. Wait a minute now, let me quote you some Bible verses again. Stop the Bible verse. Oh, stop the Bible verse. I know you want that, sinner, but I'm not going to stop. Revelation 3.19, Jesus speaking now. Jesus speaking, red letters. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So you really don't have any opinions of your own, really. You're just confused. I'm a Bible uh, parrot. I'm a Jesus broken record. That's all I desire to be. Make a mockery of it. Because I want to be like Jesus and I want to preach the Bible? How is that a mockery? Jesus would do what you're doing? He sure he did. He didn't. Retarded. Neither, sinner. But from a sinner's perspective, you probably think I'm both. But I don't really care what you think about me. All I care is what God thinks of me. I don't know God's pleased. I'm preaching His word. I feel like you can memorize every verse, and that's cute and it's adorable. Of course you can do that. You have a great mind, but I don't. I don't have every verse memorized. Not even close. And it's the, it's not cute to memorize the Bible. It's 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 mandated by God. You know, the Bible says, "How can a young man stay pure?" By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. That's why I, do, I hide it there because I don't want to sin against God. I want to obey Him. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 says, Meditate upon this law day and night that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. I want to, I want to be careful to everything He tells me to do. So I think about His law. I think about His word day and night. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, just a, I'm just, hey, I'm just a broken record of the Bible. I'm just a, just a Jesus parrot. I don't care. Call me what you want. That's what I am. And I, 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 I am pleased with that. That's what I want to be. That's what you should be. No, I'm teaching as I quote. Yeah, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Exactly. I know what the Bible Yeah, so faith comes by hearing and hearing. By, I want you to have faith in Christ. So I'm going to preach you the word. Which, if you mix it in your heart with faith, you can have eternal life. So you have quotations, and then you have and finger pointing. You're going to hell. You're sure, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. I mean, obviously, you don't like those parts of the Bible because you're one of the ones who's condemned right now. Oh, I but, don't mind it. I'll listen to the Bible all day. I believe every religion is correct because that's what every single person believes. Wait a minute now. Every religion is correct? So you don't believe in the law of non-contradiction? Wait a minute, that's not what you said though. I agree that everyone has free will and is entitled to believe what they want, but things that contradict you can't be right. They can't both be right. Either they're both wrong or one of them is right. Where does it say that in the Bible? And so, well, you believe your religion, but I believe you're an idiot. That makes us both right. <laughs> no. Well, you would, uh, you're not right in calling me an idiot. You're not right in calling me that. I'm not an idiot. Well, that's what you believe. That's not what I believe. I feel like I'm the one who said you believe this. So I can be an idiot and not an idiot at the same time? Uh, yeah, yes. you're an, he can believe you're an you're idiot and everyone can believe you're an idiot. This is between ignorance and stupidity. You're stupid. <laughs> Smart as you may be. Okay, so I can be stupid and not be stupid at the same time. No, you cannot be ignorant and still be stupid. So you're, you're a walking contradiction, young man. I don't, I don't even think you even know what you're saying yourself. But what you said earlier is that all religions can be right at the same time. Now, if you mean by, is it by right you mean that people can believe in different religions and really believe with all their heart? But in the end, you're going to find out they're all wrong, except for one of them. How do you know? Well, because Jesus, my Lord, who rose from the grave, defeating because sin and death, who claimed to be God in the flesh, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. 
No one comes to the Father but by me. That's a pretty intolerant statement to make, but it's true. See? So you said that the Roman Catholic saints were all wrong. So you say that Roman Catholics is not a church at all and it's not even Christian. No, it's not a Christian church, not, not by any means. No, Roman Catholicism is not Christian. Not by any means. Not by any means. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fraud. It's a fake of true Christianity. Just to, just to clue you in on the law of contradiction, the law of contradiction says that two things cannot be the same in the same way. Now, when you say the law of non-contradiction, and you're saying you're not an idiot, we all mean different ways. We mean you think you're an idiot, and you think you're not. But it's both the same ways, not different ways. Yeah, man, you're confused. No. It's a law of non-contradiction, not the law of contradiction, the law of non-contradiction. And I agree with what the rule you gave, but that's not what he said. He said all religions can be right at the same time. Well, that's what I'm refuting. That's what I'm refuting the whole time. So why are you arguing when you're agreeing with me? When he says you're an idiot. I don't care if you think I'm an idiot. I don't care what you think about me. What I do care is where you're going to spend eternity. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to have eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you believe that you're going to heaven, I believe... No, I don't believe that. that. I don't believe that. You don't believe you're going to heaven? No, I believe I'm going to the kingdom of God. Wait. I don't go up in the clouds and strum on a harp on a baby, okay? That's not a biblical concept. The biblical concept is you go you go to Hades and die, and then when the resurrection comes, you get risen from the grave and live on the new heaven and new earth here. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. That's where I will be. I'm never going to where God is. I'm not going there. That's not biblical. That's Gnosticism. Okay? To, to think that your, your spirit, like your body stays here, your spirit goes up into the clouds, and you're with Jesus forever, and you're just, you know, strumming harps on clouds with diapers on. That's not biblical. That's like, I don't even know where that came from, but I, I think it came from Gnosticism. But biblically speaking, when I die, if I die before Christ returns, I will go to Hades, the abode of the dead. Yeah, all the wisdom, all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. Go hit that stem again. And Christ commands all of you to repent. Never done drugs in my life, sinner. He commands all men everywhere to repent. Because coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And if you're not righteous, you're in trouble. Now give up your unrighteousness and start living righteously. Start obeying God, following Him, as He commands you to do. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Keep the commandments of Jesus. He is Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. There's no good reason to be a sinner. There's no good reason, not in this life, not in the life after this, to continue to be a sinner. Half of the population of the world would disagree with you. Well, it'd be more than half. It'd be probably like 90%. But majority does not equal truth, young man. Truth equals truth. I don't say what truth is. God knows what truth is. God determines what truth is. Without God, there's no truth. I just parrot what he says. I just, a broken record for it. I want you to say what Jesus said. You said, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There he did. John chapter 8. You're a liar. John 8. And he said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed, and he calls himself the truth. So he's the one who can set you free from your sins, from condemnation. And when Christ sets someone free, not just from the punishment of sin or from the guilt of sin, but also from the power and practice of it, that you'll stop it. You know? I used to be a drunkard and a fornicator. Hell yeah! I used to be a liar and a thief. I used to be a porn watcher and a lustful person. But Christ changed me. And now I'm a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. I forsook all that and now I follow Jesus Christ. That's what he commands you to do. And that's your only hope. It's your only hope for eternal life in this and, and the hereafter. Give up your guilty conscience. Give up your sin and follow Jesus Christ. You know your sin does you no good. You might get a little temporal pleasure from your sin, but it does you no good. Drunkenness is destroying your liver, your kidneys, killing your brain cells. You're probably puking the next day. Yes. Wake up with a dry mouth. There we go. Your hand was in the way. Wake up with a dry mouth. Your body's 
Your body's screaming at you to stop being a drunkard. But, but those things are nothing compared to what will happen to drunkard and eternal. A drunkard will go to hell. And they'll have more fun. And they'll drink lava heavy for all eternity. Listen, Jimi Hendrix, best Tom. In hell? In hell? In hell? Yeah, he is. That's what I mean. Yeah, but you, you don't understand. You're going to be on fire. Try having fun while you're on fire. I'll be dead. I Get a lighter out and light your hand for five minutes to see what happens. And imagine having all over your body for all eternity. No, you won't. You'll be alive. You'll be more alive than you are now because you'll be on fire and you won't burn up. Yeah, well, this won't be a trip. This will be a reality, young man. You'll be in hell and it'll be your reality for all eternity. There'll be no escape. There's no fire exits out of hell. No fire exits out of hell. If you go there, you'll be there forever. You'll never get out. But Christ wants to deliver you before that happens. Christ wants to change you before that happens to you. Today is the day of salvation. Forsake your sins and follow Christ. There's no prayer to pray. There's no asking Jesus into your heart. No, yeah, once you repent of your sins, you forsake them, and trust in Christ, and let it, yes, you must get baptized. The Bible commands you to get baptized. You can never pray and get to heaven. Well, I didn't say that, but the Bible never says, the Bible never says pray to get to heaven. Anytime someone's asked, how do I get saved, it says repent and be baptized. Right, I know that. Never says to pray. It says to Never says to ask Jesus into your heart. That's never found in the Bible. Yeah, you need to repent, believe the gospel, be baptized. Well, at least you're being honest now. You're on the highway to hell. I agree with that. But get off the highway to hell. The narrow path that leads to life is crossing over the highway to hell right now. And we're pleading with you to get off the highway to hell and get on the narrow path that leads to life. Right now, you're on the broad path that leads to destruction. And there are many who are on that path. There are many who go that way. But narrow is the way we use life, and there are few who find it. Few. Right now, if you're a sinner, you're a part of the many, but you need to become part of the few. Give up all of your sins. It's not going to do you any good. And friends, there'll be no laughing on Judgment Day. Be no laughing for sinners in hell. Yeah. Just weeping and gnashing of teeth, the Bible says. Peter's going to laugh at you so much. <laughs> Who's going to laugh at me? Peter. No, he's not. I'm preaching the same gospel he preached. If I were, I would slap the jack crap out of you, man. <laughs> well, I don't care what you would do. You're a sinner. Peter wasn't a sinner. Peter was a saint. Peter would not do the same thing you would do. So don't go compare yourself to him. What you would do is what he would do. Maybe he'll cry and he'll pat you on the back and say, it's okay, it's not your fault. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you know anything about Peter, to be honest. <laughs> you know yeah, I do. I know a lot about Peter. You can read a passage yeah, and tell I me all about what you can read. I know a lot about Peter. <laughs> I know Peter said that only the obedient will inherit eternal life. Yeah, I know, I know Peter said that uh, in the last days, mockers will come out of abundance, walk according to their own lust. Yeah. It says, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, Do not forget this one thing, that the Lord, with the Lord one day is a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah, he's long-suffering towards you. Not wanting you to perish, but wanting you to come to repentance. But he's not slack concerning his promise. He's going to come back and he's going to judge your life. And you're not ready. You're right. I can see to your stupidity. You win. So knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? What sinners and mockers say in their hearts. Where is Jesus isn't coming. Jesus isn't coming back. <laughs> but he is coming back. And he's going to punish you. that when I was in fourth grade, too. What's that? That my grandma had me read the Bible when I was in fourth grade, too. So because you read it in fourth grade, it's not, not true? No, no, no. I'm just saying, good job. You can read a book. I'm proud of you. Uh huh. Yeah. You can, you can read and you can speak. Welcome to America. Yeah. The Bible says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God? should lead you to repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath and a day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who are under each one according to his deeds. 
Eternal life to those who by patience and continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Every soul of man. You don't like it, do you? You're going to have... You're going to have all the fingers pointing in Judgment Day. Because I know that I'm an asshole. You point fingers at me all day. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. We can sit here and do this back and forth all day. You know what? My main concern for you, young man, is that you're, you're on your way to hell. My main concern for you is attention. Oh, so no. huh? Look at me. Look what I can do. Look at all the things that I can say about my religion and my faith. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I do want your attention because I want you to hear the truth. That, that's just for me, for selfish, not for selfish ambition or selfish gain. Sure. Actually, I'm very introverted by nature. You ask anyone who knows me, I don't, I don't, I don't care to talk in public. I don't care to be the life of the party, whatever. I don't care for that at all. Oh, we have at least one thing in common. But I, I do care for your soul, young man. I don't want you to end up in hell. That's the only reason I come here. You're going about it all the wrong way. Well, it says you. I don't take counsel from the ungodly. It says everyone here laughing at you. I don't care. Ble <laughs> Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. I don't do it the way you tell me to. I do the way God tells me to. And this is what he tells me to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what I'm doing. What do you hear whisper near, shout from the rooftops? What do you hear in darkness speaking to light? That's what I'm here to do. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Whether you like the method, whether you like the message or not, whether you hate me or not, I don't care. If for the first time you're speaking softly enough to where everyone has to stop, stop talking and actually listen to the words that you're saying. Instead of hearing you scream and shout and all these things, everyone has to stop. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and declare the word of God. That's what I've done. Because I want everyone to hear, young man. Hey man, if you're a trumpet, you're still playing all the wrong notes. It doesn't matter how you... Well, so says the sinner. You don't have the right song sheet. That's your problem. Your song sheet is sin, 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 sin. My song sheet is the word of God. I obey God. I don't obey you. I don't want to take your advice. I mean, I don't want anyone to obey me. Please don't think that. Well, you're trying to give me advice. So if I took your advice, I'd be obeying you. Yeah, but I'm not here to take your advice. I'm here to tell you the truth. I want you to be saved. Well, far be it for me to feel that every human being can learn from one another. Yeah, what's your name? Matthew. Oh, I like that name. I bet you do. Yeah, my name's Kerrigan. I don't know what that means. Well, it's an Irish name. Isn't that what we put on a name at <laughs> right? the top? He could be the gift of No, I don't think so. Don't yeah, it's an Irish name. Family name. But uh, I'll be praying for you tonight, Matthew. Straight up. I'll get right with God. We have to finish up for the day, I think. So thank you for listening. Please get right with God before you die. The